Well, good morning, friends, and thanks for joining us today uh, again for uh, our live on uh, Facebook live church service. I know it's not the same, and many of you are struggling, and I get that. I totally get that. In fact, I'm feeling the much, very much the same way, and it's been good. Uh, if you've not checked out the YouTube Acoustic First Baptist Church of Attica on YouTube, there are a couple of videos there of, of uh, Barry and Matthew uh, leading in some worship music, and it's been a delight to me to listen to those. And I trust that it will be to you, too, and that you'll check those out. Otherwise, you can use the Spotify list. Again, I want to encourage you, whatever you're doing at home, to do it together as a family, uh, to do it uh, as a group. Um, your church, so to speak, uh, lives within the four walls of your house, and it's your chance to minister to each other and encourage each other until we can get back together again, which I'm looking forward to indeed. Well, again, today is uh, Palm Sunday, and we're not together, so we can't do a lot of the things that we would normally do uh, getting ready for our Easter time. But one of the things that we have been talking about is we've been talking about fasting. And today I want to finish the fourth and final piece of this message on, on fasting, on uh, choosing again to uh separate ourselves from something that's normal and customary, uh, something that's not bad in itself, but to set those things aside. Uh, as we think about it this morning, again, we used a, a theme last week of, of darts. <laughs> and uh, you may not be a dart player, but uh, I've enjoyed playing some darts recreationally. Um, as we think about uh, this as a game, and anyone really can hit the dartboard, right? You can, uh, you just step up and you fling it, right? I remember being in my grandparents' basement as a kid, and they had a dartboard down there, and we would go down and play, and and uh, Todd and I especially, we would get back as far as we could and just hurl the dart and try to hit the dartboard. Um, it wasn't really playing. We didn't realize that there was a game to be played other than make this thing stick in the wall. And there is a little bit more to it than that, right? If you want to be a professional dart player, if you want to, up your game as far as darts goes, it's going to take uh, it's going to take some practice. If you want to be the uh, the Attica Village Dart Champion, for example, it's going to take some work. Maybe you don't know this already, but there are things about darts that I didn't know until I started playing with my friend John. Uh, there are things called well, these little plastic things on the end. They're called flights. And uh, depending on what style of dart you have, um, there are actually different styles of darts. The weight of the dart, um, how hard you throw it, whether you put a little bit of a hump in it. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of technique that goes into it. It takes practice. And eventually you get to the spot where you begin to hit the target, right? The goal of playing darts is to be able to hit the same spot when you want to, right? To be able to aim at it and hit it. And that uh, takes a little bit of work. We've talked about last week about bullseyes, right? About not just hitting the board, but hitting the right spot on the board and uh, making that a perfect throw every time. Uh, developing some muscle memory, some ability to go back and every time be able to be consistent. You know, the Christian life's a lot like that. A consistency and practice and these things called, called disciplines. We're going to look at that again today. But I can guarantee you, I can make sure that you will never, ever, ever get better at darts. Do you know how? Well, I'll just encourage you to go sit at the bar and drink another, another pint. To, to never go near the dartboard. To never pick up a dart. Um, that's a guarantee that you'll never get better. Never practice. You never play. You don't even watch. You say... I don't dart. I don't play. I don't do that thing. And that will guarantee you'll never get better at it. Well, friends, in light of what we're talking about with fasting, maybe that's your spot. Uh, you're saying, no thanks. I don't fast. I don't believe in that. And there are reasons why. Maybe the fasting has fallen on hard times. Uh, and it's not very comfortable. I know that. 
And uh, it's a discipline. It takes work, it takes effort. But you will never grow as a dart player if you never play. You'll never grow as a faster. You'll never grow better at fasting unless you fast. And so I want to encourage you this morning. Why are we, why are we doing this? Why are we talking about fasting? Well, here's a quote from uh, David R. Smith as he writes about fasting in a book entitled something like uh, For Forgotten Fasting. Uh, he says, fasting melts us into a more complete realization of the purposes of the Lord in our life our church, our community, and our nation. Right? There's something about fasting that strips some things away and really zeroes us in on the point, the, the purpose of the Lord. That's the bullseye. We talked about it last week. Fasting is about intensity. It's about uh, focused attention. It's about putting our attention on God. It's about making Him the center, His purposes, and fasting helps us to focus in on those. The greatest danger of neglecting the spiritual disciplines, Whitney says, is the danger of missing God. You get that quote? That's a pretty tall challenge, isn't it? If this is true, then fasting is the most important thing we can do. Or the spiritual disciplines, at least, are the most important things we can do. To not miss out on who God is and what he's up to what his purposes are, what his intentions are for us, for our family, for our church, for our village. Begin to think about these truths. Uh, Whitney is proposing that skipping fasting will diminish or, or dampen or even darken our understanding of God. Man, when you think about it that way, I don't want that. No believer wants that. No believer wants to walk away and say, I have no idea what God's doing. I have no idea who God is. We talk about him on Sunday, but he's kind of a thought out there. I, I don't know him personally. See, a believer, a disciple, is one who longs to know God better. He longs to come into a closer relationship with God and find it refreshing. Not boring, not dull, but bright and cheerful. If you have no desire to know God better, if you have no desire to develop in your spiritual strength and health, then you're, not, you're no di disciple, and maybe you're no believer. Because it's truly that a believer wants this deeper, more intimate knowledge of him. I want to ask you again, are you truly a disciple? Are you truly a follower of Jesus Christ? If you are, then fasting won't be a discouragement to you. It'll be a delight. It'll be something that you'll pursue Again, Whitney says that the presence of the Holy Spirit causes all those in whom he resides to have new holy hungers they didn't have before. Have you found that to be true in your life? That you have desires that you never had before. You never had the, the push or the emphasis to talk with people about your faith. But now that you're a believer in Jesus Christ, the Spirit challenges you, right? First John talks about the fact that the Spirit of God ministers with our spirit and is evidence that we are in Christ. It's the Spirit in us, it's, it's His presence in us that causes us to be energized about these holy hungers. We didn't have them before. There was nothing there that we uh, enjoyed doing, and now we delight in these things, right? Spending my Sunday morning going to sit in a in a place with a bunch of people that I kind of know to talk about God so I might know them better and might know him better, that never would have been on your radar screen before. In fact, maybe you've pitched that overboard and you need to get back to it. Uh, I can't wait again, like I said before, to get back to that spot when we're together again in one place. Not because it's more spiritual to be together in one place, but because I miss you. And I miss seeing your faces. I miss uh, preaching to a, a people group rather than to a screen. But I trust that it will be an encouragement to you today as you think about these things. We turn your Bibles to Romans 8. This passage really draws out this truth that Whitney has proposed, that this holy hunger has come into our heart. Right When Paul wrote to the Romans, he challenged them and he said these things. He said in verse 5 of chapter 8, 
For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. See what Paul was saying? Paul was saying exactly what Donald Whitney said. He says, look, it's the Spirit of God in you. It's the fact that Christ has rescued you. You see, the gospel has to come first. We have to be reminded that we're in Christ. We have to be reminded of this truth that Jesus, who is the perfect, unique, holy Son of God, came to earth to live among us. That he came to be with us intentionally. He came to be with us who were not holy, who were not lovely, who were living according to the flesh who are living according to our own desires. And the spiritual disciplines really are this truth of, I don't want to be that way. I don't want to pursue the, the hungers that I used to have. I want to be different. I want to have those things changed. And how can we do it? It's not by willpower. It's by the Spirit who lives in us. Jesus died for us. He paid the penalty that we deserved. He took our place. We had sinned against God and gone our own way and we were destined to be separated from him forever. Holiness and unholiness can't be coexistent. And so Jesus, who is holy and perfect, died in our place. He was our substitute. And in substituting um, for us in putting himself in that place, Jesus died literally for us and paid in full our debt. So now by grace, through faith, we've been saved. It's not of ourselves. It's a gift from God. It's not of these works, even of fasting. So we can't boast that we have earned something with God. Instead, because we have grace, it flows out of that. Literally, Whitney says the, pra the spiritual disciplines are practices derived from the gospel, not divorced from the gospel. You can't separate, well, here's my faith and here's my works, right? James makes that really clear. He talks about the fact that by our works, we demonstrate that we've received the grace of God. It's by those, by that grace that we are one with Christ, that we can even begin to think about the holy hunger to have the spirit in us and to be changed radically. So you might say it this way if we look at the dartboard again, right? What's the bullseye? Well, Whitney calls them holy hungers. Uh, we, we'll talk about them today, about the, this hunger for knowing God more. Last week we talked about um, the glory of God and God's desires. Uh, those three phrases really are the same phrase, the same bullseye, right? To hunger and thirst after righteousness, Jesus said. When he talked in the, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, he was talking about this desire to know God more and to serve him with everything we've got. I wonder, do you have that hunger? Is that hunger in you? It's a good hunger. It's a good kind of hunger that reminds us of who God is. Well, today, I just want to review those last five purposes. These are ten purposes that Whitney has laid out. I've, I've modified them slightly, but basically it's his list. Um, I want to remind you of the things we talked about last week, which are these. Fasting helps us pray with greater focus or intensity. Uh, it uh, it kind of clears the slate and allows us just to put our energy into praying. And fasting and prayer go together hand in hand. The second one is to seek God's will in any decision, right? The prayers that we're looking for often are, God, show me what to do next. And not just uh, not just the big things, but in every day that, that I might fast in this purpose. I think fasting is an intensifier, right? And so it's usually... 
these moments of really intense emotion, right? It, it is a big decision. Uh, who's to say we, we can't have smaller decisions as well? Be in this place of, I'm, I'm going to spend more time in prayer today. Now, that's a good thing to do and seek God's will. Third, to express grief over abuse or death or even over sin. As we've been attacked or as we're seeing death in our world and it doesn't make sense, I might even add in here to express grief over sickness. Right? We've got a couple of people from our church family now that are, are thinking they have at least similar symptoms to COVID-19 virus. And uh, the coronavirus, this special coronavirus, uh, seems to have affected them. And we might take time to express grief over that and pray for them. Um, there's a, a fourth thing to seek deliverance or protection, right? When something big's coming, and again, uh, right now our, all our mind is filled with this virus, we might pray for deliverance or protection. Is that's legitimate? That God is in charge of that. Now, if God decides to take us through sickness or through pain or through suffering, that's certainly up to Him. But I think expressing those emotions to God with fasting certainly uh, ramps it up, right? It says, God, this is really important. Now, it doesn't coerce God, right? That was a failure. Um, it doesn't manipulate God. Here's the fifth one, to express repentance and a recommitment to obedience, right? Lots of the times when people would put on sackcloth and ashes and they would uh, put d even dirt on their heads, they would say, I am lower than dirt. I am, I am wasted by my sin. And I want to express how I understand that it's broken fellowship with you, God, and that really bums me out <laughs> in a really big way. That That is horrible. It's grief. It's intense. Fasting was used in all those ways. Here are some other purposes, though, as we look at them today. Here's a new one for us to consider. One, The sixth one is to demonstrate humility before God. Uh, throughout Scripture, there's all kinds of places where people would would uh, kneel or prostrate themselves for prayer, all right? And, and fasting has a similar kind of, it's a, it's a physical response of a spiritual happening, right? Something's happening in my heart and I'm humble before God and I want to demonstrate that and so I'm going to fast. I'm going to deprive myself of sustenance and find my sustenance in God. That is, like Jesus said, there's more to life than just eating bread. Right? To listen to the word of God. I'm demonstrating a humility before him. Again, not manipulating him. So a couple of examples of this is in 1 Kings 21. We have the king Ahab. Right, Ahab is not a godly man. But when he comes to the end of himself, when he begins to understand that he's not all that in a bag of chips, he's not as good as he thinks he is, he falls down before God and he humbles himself. And God takes notice, and he even says to the prophet, he says, look, don't you see Ahab? Ahab has, has laid himself out in hum humility. That's not like Ahab. And I've noticed, God says. And so I'm not going to bring the judgment that I had planned. That's incredible. Or you have also a godly man, David, who does the same thing in Psalm 35. He comes and he, he fasts before God to demonstrate his humility before him. Psalm 35, 13 talks about this, this prayer of, of David that he was afflicting himself. He literally said, look, I'm going to say no more food for me. I'm going to talk to God about this. I'm not going to be comforted in these other things. Instead, I'll come before God and demonstrate my humility before God if God would answer. Now, here's a seventh one. A seventh purpose for godly fasting is to show concern for the work of God. This is an interesting one, and I want to I want to turn there and look at it. In the book of Nehemiah, I, we talked about this I think last week, and Nehemiah is trying to rebuild a city and and a temple. Um, Nehemiah seems to be more focused on the the city and the wall. Ezra seems to be more focused on the temple, and we'll talk about him in a moment. But Nehemiah in chapter one. It says, and they said to me, the remnant there in the province who have survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. 
So Nehemiah considered, I'm hearing this report about the people of God back there in Jerusalem, the remnant, the la- people the leftovers, they're struggling. Uh, they're, they're caught up in sin. They're, they're, the wall is a, an image of what's happening in their spiritual life. It's broken down. And so he, he hears that. And as soon as I heard these words, verse 4, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And then verses 5 through 11 really are this prayer, this heartfelt prayer while he's fasting. Fasting was a demonstration that he was concerned for the work of God, for the people of God. For God to do his work in these people specifically, and it crushed him. Man, I wonder if we think about that in terms of people here in Attica, people in our city, people in our churches, even marriages in our church, right, that are, that are going through some stress right now. Have, we ever, have you ever fasted for someone, maybe a, a wayward child? Um, just you're so overwhelmed by the report you're hearing. You say, no, you know what? I'm not going to eat. I'm just going to go pray. I'm just going to talk to God about the seriousness that I'm, I, God, I'm on your side. God, I want to see the same things you want to see happen here in this village, here in this home, here in this church. Uh, Daniel does something similar in Daniel 9. But back in Ezra in chapter 9, just a page or so over, um, Ezra hears about the people of Israel have intermarried. They've taken on foreign wives, uh, wives that are pagans, they're not believers, and they've drawn the hearts of the people away. And Ezra says, this is wrong. And he comes unglued and he's, he's confessing the sins. In chapter 10, It says, while Ezra prayed and made confession, weeping and casting himself down before the house of God, a very great assembly of men and women and children gathered to him out of Israel, for the people wept bitterly. This fasting became became contagious, you might say. This is a good kind of contagion. It began this revival, and people began to come, and uh, Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, of the sons of Elam, addressed Ezra, and he said this, We have broken faith with our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. But even now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. Right? The fasting of Ezra actually brought about this revival, began to stir the hearts of people. They said, man, Ezra's really serious about this. I wonder if we have forgotten to get that serious about sin and about God's work in our midst. Fasting is a way to demonstrate that before others and before God, we're serious about growing. We're serious about saying no to sin. We're serious about doing some house cleaning. We're serious about uh, getting our hearts right before God. There's This is a real purpose behind fasting, a real good one. Here's another one, to minister the needs of others. Well, here's one I hadn't considered before, but I'd heard people talk about it. Um, but I didn't think about it in terms of fasting. It's, it's This is the kind of fasting that says, I'm going to put something that's valuable to me aside for a, a while so that I might use the resources or the time or the money uh, or the energy to, to minister to somebody else. It's the idea of, I'm going to skip a meal to go help someone. I'm going to skip some eating time uh, to put my energy into this. I'm going to keep Preaching, for example, without eating. Um, It's interesting, like we talked about the feeding of the 5,000 not very long ago. Jesus going a long time into the night and then them saying, wait, wait, it's late. They haven't had anything to eat. They'll faint if they go away. They kind of blew past lunch and went into dinner time. Um, That would be really great. And I'm not anticipating you're going to do that today. I'm trying to keep it short and sweet and to the point. But to minister the needs of others, Isaiah 58, uh, 6 and 7, great passage. It talks about uh, what people were trying to do. They were trying to uh, fast before God, but they weren't really putting their attention on what God cared about. Uh, They were doing their own thing. And God calls them on it. He calls them on this relationship where they're, they're fasting, but then as soon as they're done fasting, they go out and they abuse people. They treat them poorly. And so he says, look, that's not the kind of fasting I want. Isaiah 58, 6 and 7 says, 
Is not this the fast that I choose? Listen up. These are the purpose statements that God has for fasting. To loose the bonds of the wickedness, to undo the straps of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your home? When you see the naked, to cover him and not to hide yourself from your own flesh. Then shall your light break forth like dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Right? There's the glory of the Lord. That's the purpose. That's the foundation. But it's interesting that he says the kind of fasting I'm talking about is sharing your bread. I'm fasting from taking all the bread myself and giving it to someone else. In Philippians, Paul talks about in Philippians 4.18 that the Philippians didn't need to give him anything. He didn't really need their gift but they had sacrificed for him. I don't think that's just that they were offering, they gave their offering in the plate. I think they were giving what they needed to live on, right? And our offerings at church, even though we're not there putting it in the plate right now, uh, giving your offering, giving your money to the church and to the church body is a sacrifice. I get it. And especially in this season when some of you are out of work, it's going to require a sacrifice. It's going to require some serious fasting. It's going to require a partnership that it's a level at a level that maybe we haven't done in a while. I, this this crisis is really challenging us, isn't it? It's challenging us to think about what our purpose is for these activities. As we think about them this morning, here's a ninth purpose. We're almost to the end now. Ninth purpose. Uh, to really focus on overcoming temptation and retrain our taste buds. Uh, again, in Ezra 10, uh, remember those wives, those foreign wives, it says in chapter 10, verse 19, that they the priests pledged this to put away their foreign wives. Now, I don't think this is a put away in the sense of they hired a hitman, right? And put them away. Bow, bow, bow. I don't think it's necessarily the idea of divorcing, although that's a possibility. But I think it's the idea of they put them away and the, they put them away for a time. They put them away from them so they wouldn't listen to their voices. There's a separation definitely there, whether it's divorce or not, I'm not sure. Uh, but think about this, that they put away, they fasted from their wives, you might say. They literally, being married is not wrong, but they put themselves away from their wives so they could have put their attention on the most important things, which was serving God. Um, 1 Corinthians 7, 5 talks about that you might set aside having marital relationship with your wife or your husband for a time, but by agreement for prayer, for the purpose of praying. It's sometimes overcoming temptation. It's sometimes putting some things aside. Romans 6, 12 and 13 says, we don't have the same passions we used to. We don't live like the world anymore. Uh, we sim are disciplining ourselves to godliness, First Timothy says, right? And sometimes when you, you find a person that's caught in an addiction, it's really good. Sometimes, often addictions are not bad in themselves, but they're, they're capturing that center part of our heart. And sometimes we need, to, we need to put those things away. We need to stop doing any of that and then add that back in with a new taste. Friends, I keep using this illustration but as long as we are apart, it is growing a taste to be together. You won't be satisfied with watching my face on a screen for long. I guarantee you. But you'll want to be together with other brothers and sisters. You won't want to just sing at the top of your lungs and have just your the quartet of you and your wife and your two kids. You'll want to have the full choir. You'll want to have the full combination. And there's a taste that sometimes fasting helps us do, helps us remember. When you fast from foods, quite often you'll come back to things that you tasted before and they'll be so sweet. You're like, wow, how did I ever do this before? Or super salty, like all the taste will just pop. That's the idea spiritually as well, that we set aside things for a time to overcome temptation and discipline ourselves, right? Here's the last one. 
And that is to enjoy worship without distraction, to enjoy God without distraction. Fasting really allows it to kind of clear the slate. I was intrigued by looking at a passage in 1 Samuel chapter 7. I don't remember reading it before, but it describes the people of Israel. And they were, they were going to war. The Philistines were coming up against them. And uh, they were uh, amassing. And, and Samuel said, we need to go before God. This is serious. Probably praying for deliverance. And as he does, he sacrifices. As Samuel is sacrificing, can you imagine this? Right? that our enemy comes crashing through the back door of the church in the middle of the service. Some, some churches have had that happen. But in this case, as they, were, as they were worshiping before God, as they were fasting in this place, as they were coming before God, it says that God thundered and drove the Philistines back. Why? Because fasting says, I'm, I'm going to focus on God. And God will help clear some of those things around us. He wants us to enjoy and worship God without any distraction. Jesus often went off to a solitary place, right? To spend time alone with God. To be in a kind of fasting from his disciples for a while. Not that those guys were bad. But they just spent time in solitude. You should read Richard Foster's chapter in the Celebration of Discipline on solitude. It's intriguing to think about being alone with God. And why we don't do it. I think it's sometimes the thing about fasting. We have so many things that are creeping in. Uh, John Piper said it this way. When God is the supreme hunger of our hearts, he will be supreme in everything. Bullseye. Bullseye. That's exactly what fasting is for. That's exactly what we're supposed to take away from this study. That it's not... It's not the weakness of our, our weakness of our hunger is not that God's not savory, that he doesn't taste good, right? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. But it's that we keep ourselves stuffed with other things, Piper said. There are things like, uh, I, there are things of idols, right? We talked about that in week one, that, that, that our heart is an idol factory, that we have a whole bunch of things that are secondary. That's why the first commandment says, have no other gods before me, none right? That those things creep in and they steal our hunger for God. They take our appetite away. Sometimes our selfish goals, right? That was our second week that we talked about. The selfish goals that are failures. Failing at fasting is really easy. We just let ourselves be in charge. We let our own desires be the bullseye instead of God's desires. We use fasting, manipulate God. We use fasting to our own ends. Or sometimes it's the cares of the world. Right, things that creep in and steal away our joy and our focus on God. But we need to fast. We need to come to this spot. This is really the conclusion of the series, and the conclusion of the message is really simple. Fast. Choose to fast. Choose to follow God's leading in fasting. Whether it be as an individual or as a family, uh, whether it be as a church, again, I... As a pastor, I don't want to mandate it, right? I don't want to say, you must fast and this is when we're going to do it. Because it's really got to be God-initiated. It's really got to be God-ordained. I can tell you it's biblical. Uh, Jesus did it. It's historical. The early church did it. Um, And to, to great benefit to them, it deepens our appreciation, our communion with Christ. It puts him back at the center It allows him to be the supreme hunger of our heart. And the Spirit convicts us of that often, doesn't he? And we just kind of brush him off. No, I don't dart. I mean, I don't fast. I don't don't do those things. I just want to say, this is the bullseye. To fast, to spend time with God, and allow that hunger to be deepened. So here's just a couple of suggestions. Maybe a couple of days this next week. This is Holy Week. We're leading up to Easter. Maybe, maybe another day and, and Holy Saturday after Good Friday. And, and our Good Friday is going to look a little bit different. And uh, I'll probably have a live stream where I just challenge you a couple, about a couple things on the crucifixion and what it meant. Um, and as we wait on Saturday, it would be a great day. Or maybe you say just on Saturday, one day this week. I can't do two days. I can't do more than one day. One day. Choose Saturday. And again, as we choose together as a church to do it on Saturday, that'd be great. 
Or maybe it's one meal this week. Just one meal. Take time. Maybe go for a walk out into the woods if you've got woods uh, around the block. Just quietly praying, asking God, I'm skipping my meal today to focus on you. And listen. And hear what God has to say. And then, or maybe it's just one item this week. Maybe you give up coffee for the week. Or maybe you give up donuts for the week. Or maybe you give up, I don't know, whatever it is that's important to you. Or maybe you give that up. Maybe it's one hour of sleep. Maybe you get up an extra hour early. You give up one hour of sleep and spend time with God. Whatever it is, make sure you're drinking lots of water, uh, taking rest, lower the activity if you're in a fast from food. Um, take care of those things, but spiritually, read and pray. Uh, take those moments, those extra moments that you've carved out. And again, you might not, be, not, might not be going to work. God's already created a fast from working at your office. Uh, maybe you're not a non-essential. God has set those things up. Maybe you're like a couple of our sisters that are uh, in quarantine. God has stripped a whole bunch of things away. I think I heard one say, I just cranked up the praise music, right? Good. Uh, in that moment, it's not just about hearing music. It's about thinking about God, about the messages that are coming. Jesus is our greatest reward, isn't he, friends? Brothers and sisters in Christ, Jesus Christ is our greatest reward. There is none other. We don't need any other. And so we cry out to him, God, feed our hunger. The hunger and longing is for you. The Spirit, Spirit, convict us of our shortcoming and make us more like Jesus. Lord, we want to go deeper. We want to know you more. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters that are hearing this message, have heard the whole series, that they may turn to you and fast. Fasting from everything else, let all those things be stripped away, and in simplicity we come to you. Make God make you our only goal, our only reward. We pray these things because of Jesus, our Savior, who is the one. Amen. Well, blessings on your friend, and I hope this has been an encouragement to you today. I hope you'll take time to discuss this as a family, what your game plan might be to pray about it. And then I look forward to hearing how God has used this time of fasting as a lead up to Easter and how you might celebrate together next week. Well, be well, and I look forward to seeing you again. I love you.